The Airbus A380, the world's biggest passenger plane. As tall as a seven-story building, it can carry more than 850 passengers. Nothing bigger has been attempted ever by any aircraft manufacturer on this planet. It was designed to take on the world's beating Boeing 747, a high-stakes gamble. We are talking billions in terms of development. We are betting the, the future of the company. The plane's sheer size brought logistical challenges on a scale never seen before. Its real problem is just its size. I mean, it is gargantuan. Nobody knew if a plane this big would be safe. What happens if you have an emergency and you need to evacuate? Or how it would respond in a crisis? I've never seen damage like this before on an aircraft. This is the story of the world's only super jumbo. Singapore, November 4th, 2010. Qantas Flight 32 takes off from Shanghai Airport on an eight-hour flight to Sydney, Australia. The A380 Super Jumbo is the biggest jetliner ever built. It has been flying for three years without serious incident and is the pride of the Qantas fleet. In command, Captain Richard de Crepigny. About three and a half minutes after takeoff, we were passing through 7,000 feet. And suddenly there was this enormous bang. The alarm was sounding continuously. The top panel became a sea of red lights. We knew that something was seriously wrong. An engine has exploded, sending shrapnel ripping through the wing, damaging the plane's hydraulics and engine controls. I've never seen damage like this before on an aircraft. The plane's systems are barely responding, and De Crepigny has no idea if he can get it down safely. The story of the Airbus A380 begins in 1988 in Toulouse, France. Jean Pierson, president of Airbus, is intent on shaking up the aviation world. He wants to establish Europe as a major player in aviation construction, a business dominated by America. When Airbus first entered the market in the early 1970s, uh, the US airlines basically didn't pay attention to them. They didn't take European airplanes seriously at this time. Airbus is already producing small and mid-sized planes, but only has 15% of the global market. In order to grow, Airbus must challenge the biggest name in aviation, Boeing. In 1988, the American giant makes nearly two-thirds of all commercial planes, including the mighty 747. John Pearson didn't like the fact that if you wanted to buy a bit, an aircraft with 400 seats, there's only one place you could go for it, which was Seattle and Boeing. And Pearson, known by his colleagues as the bear of the Pyrenees, rarely backs down. This is an interesting nickname, the Bear of the Pyrenees. He was a very forthright uh, chief executive. He was a very strong personality. Could be very tough. Pearson is going to go for the jugular by targeting the jewel in the Boeing crown, the mighty 747. <laughs> Launched in 1970, the 747 is the world's biggest airliner the undisputed queen of the skies. The 747 has been a legendary aircraft, and there's no question about it. The 747 made aviation available to the masses. It transformed uh, airline economics. Dubbed the jumbo jet, the 747's size allowed airlines to fly more passengers at a lower cost and make huge profits. If you have a bigger aircraft, on a per-seat basis, you get a better economy. And as the only company producing a jumbo jet, 
Boeing has reaped the rewards. Boeing had enjoyed 30 years of monopoly with the 747. Boeing were by far uh, the market leaders, and they controlled almost the entire market. Pearson's dream takes a step forward when his head of aircraft development shows him a plan for an audacious new aircraft. He presented this idea to Jean Pearson, showing a concept, very large commercial airplane, even bigger than the 747. There was no law in, uh, in airline market that the largest aircraft should forever be the 747. Pearson reasoned that an Airbus Super Jumbo would be a game changer. By carrying 25% more passengers than the 747, the airlines will be coming to Airbus instead of Boeing. But building the world's first super jumbo is no small undertaking. Failure could spell the end of Airbus. We're talking billions in terms of development, so you could say you're betting the, the future of the company. Pearson decides it's worth the enormous risk and orders his team to make it happen. But Airbus is a consortium of four manufacturers from France, Germany, Britain, and Spain. And Pearson has to convince all of them to back the colossal project. It was really a massive undertaking and a, and a big risk for the company, but also it was a strategic move which was uh, essential. It took eight years for the project to get started in earnest. In 1996, Pearson picks a crack team to develop the Super Jumbo. It's headed by one of his most experienced engineers, Jürgen Thomas. I was nominated as the head of, the, of a new division to be created, which we called the Large Aircraft Division. The need for discretion means that the biggest and costliest civil aviation project of its time starts life in an abandoned office block. We were in a, let me call it, a relatively modest building. Absolutely no facilities, no accommodation. We had no cupboards, no nothing. Just a table, chairs, maybe a telephone. We noticed that the windows didn't open. And so the running joke was that, of course, they did that in order for us not to commit suicide one, one evening of despair, working hard on something that would never happen. But Jürgen's team is not discouraged. Nobody complained. All the people which I started with were so motivated, they didn't care. Their secret super jumbo will eventually become known as the A380. But for now, the project is given the working name A3XX. It was a kind of start-up atmosphere, and they were looking at lots of solutions, trade-offs, what should be the size of the aircraft. Big debate at that time. Their first big challenge is to work out how the plane can carry a record-breaking number of passengers. Soon we realized that if we wanted to uh, have more than 500 people on board, the only solution was to put the two cabins on top of each other. So that was really different. Uh, two lines on uh, windows, you know, all through the fuselage from nose to tail. A fully double-deck jetliner has never been attempted before. Jetliners have traditionally been built with a single deck inside a round fuselage. The optimum shape of a fuselage in terms of cross-section is always a circle. But in a circular fuselage, the number of seats able to fit onto the top deck would be restricted by the curvature of the cabin. They need an alternative. There were very, very different concepts by our French friends, by the German friends, but that was good because we could put all on the table and compare and uh, say what is good or what, or what is not so good in which direction we should go. Eventually, Jürgen's team selects a revolutionary new fuselage shape, the ovoid. The genius of the ovoid concept is that it will allow two full-width decks. And with the ovoid design, 
their Super Jumbo will carry up to 193 more passengers than the 747. So the whole fuselage concept was basically around optimizing the shape for efficiency and fuel efficiency, but giving maximum comfort inside so that the passenger had that wow effect. My God, this is great. I've got lots of space, and this is a great aircraft. But the joy is short-lived. They soon discover that Boeing has started work on a super jumbo of their own. By 1996, plans to build the world's largest passenger airliner are well underway at Airbus. But Boeing gets wind of the European Super Jumbo, and in September, they announce their counter-strike. Supersizing the 747 into a competitor to the A380. the 747 next generation. Two new designs called the 747 500X and very large 600X. The race to build a super jumbo is on and Boeing already has a head start. Unlike Airbus, they have a loyal customer base and plenty of experience building big planes. I must say some people under some pressure because we were afraid that our competitor could launch their project. We were working under this menace of having Boeing again in front of us. So that was very tense. The first months were, were very, very tense. The news adds to the design pressures the team faces, of which the biggest is weight. Aircraft, they, they, they build in volume, it's 3D, so every time you increase the size, the weight increases even more than the size. Airbus had to work out ways of producing a big aeroplane, a giant aeroplane, without having giant weights to go with it. The team has to look at every element of the designs to see where weight can be cut. We had extra teams for weight chasing, that means to look at each element. No, as Boeing once said, we even look at the battery holder if we can make it lighter. So each kilo, each kilo. Then the team has a breakthrough, discovering a lightweight material called glare, a new composite of glass fibre and aluminium. But it's never been used for the main body of an aircraft before. Extensive tests show that not only will glare reduce weight by up to 30%, but it's also strong enough to be used on the plane. Yet even with this weight saving, their calculations show the A380 will still weigh 600 tonnes at takeoff, 40% more than the 747. and it will require bigger wings than any previous jetliner. To lift all this mass, you'll have to size the wing accordingly. And so you go through a lot of design loops in order to find the, the best intersection of all the parameters that will make your aircraft feasible. The wings will need a surface area of almost 850 square meters, 54% more than the wings of the 747. They will also be some of the most technologically advanced wings ever produced. These wings, they almost come apart with all the flaps and the slats on it. It's a very good wing. It's the best Airbus wing ever in aerodynamic terms. Huh? Still has a little bit uh, high weight, but from aerodynamic point of view, it's by far the best wing. The huge wings should create enough lift, but their size creates another problem. As planes move through the sky, they create spinning pockets of air. These unseen whirlwinds, or vortices, are known as wake turbulence. Wake turbulence is usually linked to the weight of the aircraft. So a small aircraft, a light aircraft, has small turbulence, and bigger aircraft, bigger wake turbulence. A very large plane could produce vortices powerful enough to rip the roofs off buildings. 
if you have enormous wake turbulence and you fly over residential areas, you can do big damage. Nobody knows exactly how big the wake turbulence for the A380 will be. So the team turns to a brand new aeronautical laboratory in Lille, France. An accurate scale model of the Super Jumbo will be launched through a curtain of smoke lit by lasers. The idea is to make the invisible turbulence visible. The test reveals that in the crowded skies above busy airports, the wake turbulence created by the giant A380 could be lethal. Smaller planes caught in its wake could be sent spiraling out of control. To ensure the A380 will enter service, Jürgen's team spends months reviewing the test data. With these tests, uh, of course, we learn some trends. This we should do, this we should not do. And we took very much uh, care to, to, to minimize wake turbulence. The team focuses on the wingtips. This is where the vortices are created when low pressure airstreams from above the wing and high pressure airstreams from beneath it collide. Eventually, they realize by adding a device called a wingtip fence, they can stop the two airstreams meeting and ensure the super jumbo will create weight turbulence no bigger than that of a 747. By December 1996, the designs for the A380 are nearing completion. The team create a graphic showing the world what it will look like in flight. Airbus is convinced their super jumbo will rival Boeing's supersize 747. But in January 1997, Boeing makes a shock announcement. They are pulling out of the super jumbo race. We learn that Boeing had decided to discontinue all activities on the very large airplane and discontinue the 747X problem. It should be good news for Airbus, but Boeing springs another surprise. They release research which says the world doesn't need super jumbos. The super jumbo business model depends on hub and spoke air travel. It's when large capacity planes fly between big hub airports and then smaller planes take passengers on to their final destination. Now Boeing has declared the entire concept redundant. Boeing has decided that there are not that many routes that are so heavily trafficked and so heavily traveled consistently that would require an airplane the size of an A380. Instead, Boeing believes the future of air travel will be on mid-sized aircraft flying directly between smaller airports, bypassing the major hubs entirely. And when Boeing speaks, the aviation industry listens. People tend to believe that whatever Boeing said is right. And even within Airbus, we had lots of people, the majority of the Airbus people, did not believe that going for a very large airplane was the way to go. Nearly a decade of effort and millions of dollars may have been spent on a plane that the world doesn't need. Jean Pierson, president of Airbus, wants to build the biggest passenger airliner in history. But his rivals at Boeing have declared the world has no need for a super jumbo. There's been a lot of naysayers, and a big one is called Boeing, I think. Uh, very big naysayers. The Boeing company is listened by most of the people in the industry. And so when they learned that Boeing was discontinuing its project, they said, you see, guys, there is no market over there. But the so-called bear of the Pyrenees remains determined. It was under Jean Pierson that the decision to continue regardless was taken. He bashed heads together. He effectively single-handedly drove that program and drove the people that were going to make it into reality. Former aerodynamics engineer Charles Champion is appointed to oversee the project's toughest stage, building the plane. The clock started ticking. 
the real big challenge at the beginning was to create the right team, to create you know, the dream team that would take the, the largest uh, civil aircraft ever manufactured to, the, to life and to our customers. But before the A380 can be built, Airbus must create new factory space in four different countries. I mean, it is gargantuan. And then to build something that large in parts all over Europe, and then assembling them in one location, it's a logistical nightmare. The wings will be built in the UK, the fuselage in Germany and northern France, and the tail in Spain. Champion will have to arrange for all the parts of the Super Jumbo to travel to the Airbus assembly plant in Toulouse. Airbus has shipped aircraft wings and fuselages before in its very own transport plane, a 55-metre-long beast known as the Airbus Beluga. But even this monster plane is too small for the job. Engineers test the idea of strapping parts of the A380 to the backs of other planes, but find it simply not practical. So Champion has to come up with something new. It was a huge challenge for the guys to, to design from scratch a completely new transportation system just for the 380. After 15 months, he resorts to the unthinkable a complex convoy of ships, barges and massive trucks all converging on southern France. It will demand coordination on an epic scale. We had to design barges in order to go through Bordeaux, the old bridge, up to Longon. But then afterwards, of course, the river is too small, so we had to go by trucks. So that was a huge project. And immediately, of course, uh, there were many challenges where to place the road, and what about the villagers, and this and that. In the tiny village of Levignac, the massive sections of fuselage almost touch the walls of the houses as they pass. They literally put the wings or fuselage on tractor trailers, and, and they drive them through these very narrow streets in these little French towns. I honestly don't know how they do it, but they, they manage. After a combined journey of more than 5,000 kilometers, the largest airplane components in civil aviation history finally arrive in Toulouse. Here, Charles Champion will oversee the construction of the biggest civilian airliner ever built. January 18, 2005. The first prototype of the Airbus Super Jumbo is revealed to the world in a glittering ceremony. You see all the stakeholders coming in, uh, the head of the customers, the head of state also. European premiers who have invested billions of dollars of public money in the project gather for the event in front of the world's media. This is the most exciting new aircraft in the world. It is European cooperation working at its best. Your heart tells you, my God, this is the best event uh, I will ever probably uh, attend because I I'm the one who was leading the program. But the star of the show is the plane itself, the Airbus A380. It's one of those emotional moments where suddenly we realize the size of what you're doing, the level of ambition, you're the largest aircraft ever in the world. But behind the smiles, there is just one piece of unfinished business. The Super Jumbo is yet to fly. That test arrives three months later, on April 27, 2005. A huge crowd gathers in Toulouse to see if the world's first super jumbo will successfully take to the skies. Huh. 
April 2005, bright day in Toulouse. 40,000 people around the fences of the airport to see this. Quite an event for us, the first flight uh, of the A380. It's the moment of truth for the test pilots, who all wear parachutes in case disaster strikes. Flight test engineer Fernando Alonso knows how dangerous this moment can be. When you fly an airplane for the first time, things can go wrong. There's no time to think what to do when you're up in the air. So you better have thought about what you're going to be doing before you actually take off. Je rappelle la procédure décollage. Pendant la course au décollage, si quelqu'un voit quelque chose qui lui plaît pas, il peut gueuler stop et j'obéirai. At 10:29 a.m., under a cloudless sky, the A380 accelerates down the runway. The huge machine lifts effortlessly into the sky. Before you got a chunk of carbon, uh, aluminium, and sitting on the ground, and then suddenly when she flies, I mean, she's alive. It flew incredibly well. Uh, it flew beautifully from, uh, I would say, from one minute after the liftoff. We had imagined this moment for years and years and years and suddenly it happens. A uh, wonderful day that I will remember all my life. After four trouble-free hours, the A380 touches down and enters the record books as the heaviest flight in commercial aviation history. Over the next 19 months, the plane undergoes 2,500 hours of flight tests. These are an essential part of aircraft certification. But for the A380, they also serve another purpose, convincing the public that flying on such a huge plane is safe. There was a public perception of, isn't it going to be dangerous, all those many people on the airplane? And yes, this airplane was big, but it was just another airplane, and it had to be handled and could be operated like any other airplane. It just happened to be bigger, that's all. The test pilots push the A380 to its limits. We went to very hot climates, we went to very cold climates. Uh, we brought the airplane to its structural limits. We brought the airplane to our aerodynamic limits. In one test, in order to identify the minimum takeoff speed, pilots deliberately drag the tail along the runway. The A380 passes every test with flying colors. The airplane behaved uh, marvelously. Uh, I'm just so proud of this airplane. Uh, I'm just so proud of those wings. I'm just so proud of these systems. But the plane's toughest test is yet to come. Airbus has built the largest airliner in history, and so far, it has passed every flight test. Now, there's only one thing that stands between the plane and it being certified to fly. Airbus must prove that in an emergency, a full plane load of 873 passengers and crew can be evacuated in less than 90 seconds, the same length of time as an ordinary airliner. The authorities were not prepared to say, OK, it's a big aircraft, we give you 120 seconds. No, 90 seconds is the rule, you get them out in 90 seconds. On March 26, 2006, in Hamburg, Germany, Airbus prepares for the largest evacuation test in aviation history. To pass, Everyone on board must be evacuated from half the exits in less than 90 seconds. And it must all be done in complete darkness. It was a big challenge. It was a big challenge and there was a fair amount of risk because if we had failed the test, then we'd have been in trouble. 
the fate of the Super Jumbo project is on the line. It's a success. Yes. All 873 people on board are evacuated in just 78 seconds, a comfortable 12 seconds under the limit. With the A380 certified for passenger service, orders are flowing in. But with a complex build, split across four countries, full-scale production quickly falls behind schedule. It became apparent that the aeroplanes weren't going to be able to be built anywhere near as quickly as Airbus had thought. To make matters worse, engineers installing the cabling discover a major problem. Many of the wires are too short. Two countries, France and Germany, have been responsible for creating the A380's wiring systems. But each had insisted on using their own computer programs. The French designers used one type of computer. The German designers stayed with the one they were more familiar with. And the computers didn't talk to one another. And had they all used the same computer, that problem would have been spotted long before it became critical. The reality is that we had five different cultures the French, the German, the Spanish, the British, but also the Airbus Central, who had a different view and different mindset. With more than 500 kilometers of cables for each A380, this small oversight has a colossal impact. We were having to move people from other parts of the, uh, the Airbus empire into Toulouse to rewire the airplane. This caused a significant delay in the delivery also cost, as you can imagine, because the first airplane had to be dismantled and the cabling had to be revised completely from nose to tail. The clash of cultures has left the entire project on the brink of collapse. It's already a year behind schedule and a staggering $2 billion over budget. This latest delay leads to the cancellation of the entire cargo version of the A380. Contracts lost with freight giants FedEx and UPS cost Airbus a further $5.1 billion in lost revenue. It was extremely, extremely painful. That was a very tough lesson, very, very tough lesson. Everything now depends on the passenger version of the A380. Singapore Airlines and the Dubai-based Emirates have orders totaling $20 billion. But with the plane so far behind schedule, no one knows if they will lose faith and pull out. The management team goes into overdrive to keep them on board. You can lose the confidence within a matter of days, so you have to explain, you have to make people understand what what's has happened, even if you are not very proud of what, uh, what you have done incorrectly. So that was very tense. Luckily, the Airbus Charm Offensive on the passenger airlines pays off. Not one customer cancelled a single A380 order, despite delays of between 18 months and two, two and a half years. It is nearly 20 years since the Super Jumbo project was conceived. Airbus have faced unprecedented technical and logistical challenges. But now, Jean Pearson's vision has become reality. The A380 is ready to enter commercial service. October 25th, 2007. See you on board. Thank you. Hundreds of passengers board a Singapore Airlines A380 
for its very first commercial flight. The biggest airliner ever built stands as tall as a seven-story building and can carry up to 30% more passengers than a 747. Its wings are the biggest ever created on a jetliner. These wings uh, amaze me. And even today, I cannot, I cannot get tired of looking at the wings. When I fly this airplane uh, commercially, I always ask for a window seat and uh, preferably near the wing, I just keep staring at it. The passengers on the maiden flight share the same excitement. Was it good? Was it good? A lot of applause uh, when the plane took off and when the plane landed and, and all of that. It was uh, really an incredible atmosphere, not like a normal flight, I can assure you. The cool thing is it's just a fantastic plane and, you know, I, I'm, just, I'm ashamed I'm not on the return flight as well. From a passenger standpoint, the A380 is a remarkable airplane. You, you walk on board and the first thing you see is this beautiful staircase. The experience is very nice. Inside the Super Jumbo, passengers are offered a level of luxury never before seen on an airliner. The 550 square meters of floor space allow for entire bedrooms with double beds and even showers just looks different to every other aircraft. It's the flagship of every airline, so the airlines will tell you that you're on an A380, and they're very proud of that fact. The next three years see orders take off. 15 international airlines have ordered 223 A380s in contracts worth an estimated $77 billion. Among the airlines queuing up to receive the Super Jumbo is German flag carrier Lufthansa. Lufthansa starts its A380 service in 2010 and today operates a fleet of 12 planes. Helmut Wagner is one of its pilots. It's very astonishing that the A380 is more agile than nearly every other airplane I flew before. It's a very, very big airplane, but you don't feel the big airplane when you steer it. In 2009, Airbus passes a major milestone. For the first time, more A380s than 747s are delivered to the airlines. Airbus's belief in the hub and spoke model of air travel has paid off. One of the former CEOs of Boeing actually said, people don't buy 747s anymore. You know, obviously people were buying A380s instead. And it appears Jean Pearson's dream of surpassing Boeing has finally been realized. But a year later, a catastrophic event will put the entire Super Jumbo project in doubt. November 4th, 2010. Qantas Flight 32 takes off from Singapore on its 6,000 kilometer journey to Sydney with 469 passengers and crew on board. As Captain Richard de Crepany climbs the A380 through 2,100 meters, passenger Mike Took watches a live feed from a camera mounted in the plane's tail. I see this puff of white smoke come out of the left-hand side of the aircraft, and there was this enormous bang. and could see a big rectangular hole in the wing. One of the plane's Rolls-Royce engines has exploded, and it's created a whole catalogue of problems for Captain de Crepany to deal with. Half the networks on the aircraft failed. We have holes in the wing, we have half our ailerons not providing lift, we have half our spoilers faulty, we have lost half our brakes. This is beyond any certification standard that any aircraft is designed to endure. De Crepany needs to get the crippled plane back on the ground. But it's too heavy and he needs to dump fuel first. Trouble is, some of the fuel systems aren't responding. In the cabin, passengers fear the worst. 
Why haven't we got down on the ground sooner? Why are we still circling after all of this time? There was perhaps something wrong that was preventing us from landing. De Crepigny has no choice other than to land the plane 40 tonnes over its maximum safe landing weight. It's another thing to add to the growing list of problems he has to deal with to get the broken airliner down safely. Now, flying the right approach speed is critical. We discovered that if we slow down one knot from 166 knots of our approach speed, we would get speed warnings. If we sped up three knots, we would run off the runway. The co-pilot calculates that on the four-kilometre runway, they will only have 100 metres to spare. De Crepigny lines up the aircraft for its final approach. It almost felt as if the floor underneath our feet was rippling because we seemed to be coming in very fast. De Crepigny's actions will now decide whether the world's biggest airliner will land or crash. As we were passing 500 and 300 feet, the aircraft alerted us with two speed warnings, which said the speed is dangerously slow. Speed, speed, speed. The plane touches down, but it's overweight, and only around half the brakes work. There was no feeling that the plane was slowing down at all. They're rapidly running out of tarmac. We just kept hurtling along the runway. It seemed like the entire airport terminal had gone past us at 150 miles an hour. Finally, the plane begins to slow. We did manage to stop before the end of the runway. We have 100 metres spare. Eight fire trucks would now protect us and protect the passengers. It's only now that the scale of the damage can be seen. An entire section of the massive engine has been ripped to shreds. The crew's safe landing of the plane was an extraordinary feat. The Qantas crew did a remarkable job. Uh, they identified the problem, they handled the emergency uh, incredibly professionally, and they were actually able to land the airplane safely back in Singapore with nobody injured. De Crepigny also credits the design of the giant plane. People often query the resilience of the A380, the largest aircraft in the sky. After QF-32, no one questions the resilience of the A380 anymore. Immediately, the engine's manufacturers, Rolls-Royce, investigate what caused the explosion. They discover that oil from a small leak had dripped into the burning hot engine, causing a fire that triggered the blast. The firm takes responsibility for the problem and acts to prevent it happening again. It was the A380's first major incident, but the Super Jumbo had proven it was strong enough to withstand it. Unfortunately, accidents happen, and almost every air aircraft type flying, if not all aircraft types flying, have, have suffered at some point in their, in their career, because engines do fail, engines do explode. The airplane was so well designed, though, even, you know, operating as crippled as it was, it got down in one piece, and everybody on board was fine. 25 years ago, Airbus boss Jean Pearson took one of the biggest gambles in aviation history. Determined to challenge the dominance of Boeing, he staked the future of his company on a super jumbo. There's always an aspect, if you like, initially of uh, betting the farm on, on one big aircraft program. This one certainly beat all the uh, rules in that respect. Nothing bigger has been attempted ever by any aircraft manufacturer on this planet. 
Today, the A380 is a common sight at the world's leading airports. It regularly outsells the Boeing 747 and has helped Airbus raise its market share from 15 to 50%. The arrival of the A380, I think, marked Airbus's coming of age in, in the industry. In the market above 150 seats, there are just two players, Airbus and Boeing. But the A380 is also transforming the way we fly. Without the A380, the airline would have to fly more frequently smaller airplanes, which means more movement, more cost, and a busier sky. Those behind the A380 haven't just made a plane, they've made history. Now when I go to London, and uh, uh, you know when you actually stand along the Thames close to the Tower Bridge, you see one A380 after the other coming in, and we say, my God, we did it, it's great. 